Father, thank you. We praise you. We give this time of looking at your word to you. And Father, speak to us. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Lead us into your truth that we may know you more and serve others. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What a powerful song that was, huh? I tell you, um, the generosity of this season and the generosity of our church has just struck a chord in my heart this this year. Um, We helped four families, three families, three families with our giving tree. And each one of those gifts were taken, and you responded so well. Um, of course, this project that we've had going on with the Burdinsky family. And then the generous hearts of our people with respect to finances in the month of December. Um, we've had over $60,000 given to our regular operating budget in the month of December. That's about twice our operating budget, two times as much as our operating budget. And um, on top of that, over $10,000 given to the Burdinsky family project. So, and throw in a couple thousand dollars towards Seeds of Faith there. You know, we've, we've had that also going on. And so I have really been moved and um, in awe of God's work. It really says a couple things to me says that we're getting it. You know, we're not, we're not perfect. No church is. We're pretty upfront about our imperfections. But we are seeking to worship God fully and that you are learning the value and the joy of being generous. And that is not just in finances. That's just all over the place. And uh, it just keeps getting better and better at the Brook Church. And um, sometimes I just have to stop and, and, and praise. So how can I stop from praising your name? It's very hard to, uh, given all that God is doing. So God bless you. Thank you. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. If you've been around the brook for a while, this is a key passage to us. In fact, it's our church verse. And so here at the beginning of 2011, I want to talk to you about the church and kind of remind you of first principles for us here at the brook. When Tammy and I moved out to Florida, we were engaged uh, in North Texas. That's where uh, we grew up, was in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And I met Tammy at church, and we dated for a while, and got engaged, and uh, I graduated from seminary before our wedding, and um, I moved out to Florida, Orlando, Florida, where uh, I was going to serve as one of the youth pastors at First Baptist Church, Orlando, Florida. So for about three months, we were separated during our our engagement, and then March rolled around, and we got married, and we moved out to Florida. And, uh, of course, Tammy loved the beach and had made many trips out to Florida with her grandparents and parents to go to the beach, and I was kind of a North Texas guy, so I wasn't really used to going to the beach at, at all. And the only beach that I had was in Lake Weatherford, and that was, you know, <laughs> a little a little Texas man-made lake. And so I go out there, and, you know, we're having a great time. And uh, so I'm out in the ocean. I'm splashing around, and uh, I look up five or six minutes after swimming, and I look back on the beach, and I don't see Tammy, and I don't see our little spot on the beach. And so I start to look around, and I go, well, maybe it's down this way a little bit. So I go down a little bit, and, of course, I went the wrong way. You have the 50-50 chance of going the right way, and I went the wrong way. And started walking back the other direction and found her and found the beach chair. And I thought to myself, man, I just really got lost there for a moment. I was telling this story to some people at the church uh, the, the Sunday afterwards, and the guy said to me, oh, yeah, he said, you, you don't understand about the current out here in the ocean. He said, you have to look every, you know, every 30 seconds, every minute or so, you have to look back at the beach if you're out in the ocean because you can be swept by the current down 
from where your original starting point was. So you've got to look back every once in a while to remember where you were. And I share that with you today because that's really kind of what I'm doing with us today. Every once in a while, we need to recalibrate. Every once in a while, we need to look back to make sure that we have not drifted because the currents of life tend to sweep us away from where we originally had planned to be. And so this morning, I want to, by way of reminder, just share with you what the church is to be biblically and also just remind all of us here at the Brook Church who we are, where we're heading, and why we're going there. And so if you're new to the church, this is a great opportunity for you to kind of see the inside information of what we really believe and who we are at the brook. And through the signs and signals and through the experiences that you've had to be able to see in black and white, in clear understanding, what we believe God has called us to be at the brook. First and foremost, being real people, finding real hope in the real world. Now, that's, that's a nice little catchy phrase, but it means a lot to us who are here. It means that we seek to be authentic in our relationship to Jesus Christ. And primarily, we receive that instruction from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. Let me read it for you, and then we're going to look at it. It says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, let's stop there for a moment. Let's get the context. Jesus has been resurrected and ascended into heaven before the very eyes of the disciples, his followers. And he promised that the Holy Spirit would come if the disciples would wait in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit would come. And sure enough, the Holy Spirit came. And at Pentecost, the celebration of Pentecost, the expressions of the Holy Spirit were evident there in the body. And out of the power of that moment, this first baby church was formed. We say baby. Actually, they had hundreds and thousands of people that initiated that first church there in Jerusalem. And so now the writer of Acts, Luke, is describing that experience. He's describing what's going on with this new church. And so he says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. In other words, God was answering prayer. God's supernatural work was evident in that group of people. They weren't just going through some motions, but the life-transforming power of Christ was evident in that group, and He was working miracles among them. Verse 44, All the believers were together and had everything in common, a sign of unity. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need, the sign of generosity. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So out of the power of that community, out of the power of the experience that they were having with one another and with the Christ who had saved them, The Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. It was growing. It was vibrant. It was life-giving. It was healthy. And God was doing an amazing work among those first followers of Jesus Christ. Now, I have a conviction. It's a conviction that I've had from the very beginning of our church, and that is this. If it's in the Word, it ought to be in the world. If it's taught and exclaimed and proclaimed in here, then the experiences that are written about in here should be the experiences that we have now in 2011. And so we're trying to connect the dots here between what we experience now to what God's Word says we should experience. And so in our way, we have tried to take this Word and particularly Acts 2, 42 through 47, and apply it in our context. What does it mean for you and for me? And we have developed a strategy, and I want to share that strategy with you this morning. It's really not a strategy so much as an application of what we just read. And there are four parts of it. And again, if you're a member of our church, you've heard this before, but it's good to be reminded of it for all of us so that we can be sure that this year in 2011 
we are facing forward with what our purposes are and that we don't drift away from what God wants us to be and what he wants us to do. Those four things are this. First of all, discover. Again, from Acts 2, 42 through 47, discover. Now, that is such an important word. It was a word that was chosen very carefully because sometimes people think that church is about hearing or that church is about spectating or that church is about witnessing or that church is about coming to church. And what we're saying that first and foremost, as a part of the application of Acts chapter 2, that God wants you and me to experience his power, and his presence in our life. And if we do anything else at the Brook Church, that is our number one priority, that we try to get out of the way and allow you to experience Christ for who he is. Not to experience church so much, but to experience him. So important. We're pretty simple here at the Brook. We're pretty simple. We have simple church, I like to call it. And so we don't, Major on the minors. We don't worry too much about presentation. (laughs) You know, how in the world did Jesus get along without PowerPoint and sound? I don't know. But presentation. We don't major on the production. We focus instead on you participating in the experience of God. And if we can do our best to point you to the Christ who will make the one and only difference in your life, and we have done our job, and for us to get out of the way and to not create any barriers that would cause you not to experience the joy and the wonder of the power and the presence of Jesus Christ in your life. So discover is the first thing. And if you come to church and you don't discover God and His power and His peace and His presence in your life, then you've really missed it. And that's what we want first and foremost. Discover. Secondly, connect. Connect. To connect to others in life-giving Christian relationships. Folks, this is so important. It's often underestimated. It is so vitally important for you and me to find life-giving relationships in and through the church a place where we can be accepted by others, a place that we can belong to others, a place where we can be cared for and can care for others, that this one hour on Sunday morning just doesn't cut it with respect to the experience of the Christian life. In fact, in the New Testament, the New Testament doesn't even have a concept of a Christian who is attending a church but is not connected to others in life-giving relationships in some way. It's just foreign to the Bible. And so we say, listen, one of our jobs, after you discover the power of the relationship that you can have with Jesus Christ, is to also discover the power of what it means to connect authentically with other Christians, because there's nothing like it. There's nothing like a place where you can be yourself, and you can be yourself with others who are also being real as well. So important. So we try to provide opportunities for that fellowship through our small groups, through our Bible fellowship groups that occur. They're Bible study opportunities, but they're also opportunities where you can connect to others in life-giving relationships. It's so vitally, vitally important. There's no language in the New Testament for an isolated Christian. So again, it's more about just coming to church. It's about participating in it. And you truly do when you connect to others. So relationships are really important here at the Brook. Not so much rules, but relationships. Third, grow. Key word, grow. Once you discover Christ, once you connect to some other believers and you begin that process of that relational dynamic, there's a need to grow deeper in your faith to grow deeper in your relationship with Jesus Christ. That all of us are on a journey. None of us have arrived. That this book is is life-transforming now and into eternity. That you can read God's Word over and over and over again, and it will speak to you in different ways, and it will transform you in different ways, and it will tell you things about your life that you thought you had taken care of, but that God is now 
doing another work in in you. And so growing is all about learning God's Word, exposing yourself to His Word. That's what we believe. This is God's Word, God's letter to you and to me. Loving it, falling in love with this book, falling in love with the Savior who is revealed in this book, and then living it. Boy, there's a big difference between what we proclaim and what we practice And here at the Brook, what we're trying to do is we're trying to narrow that gap between what we preach on Sunday mornings and how we live on Monday mornings. So to learn and to love and to live God's Word is vital to your health. And it's vital to your joy as a Christian. And so we want to provide opportunities for you to grow deeper outside of Sunday mornings. To grow deeper in love by learning God's Word. The fourth thing is this, serve, serve. Serving others, serving the community, serving the world. Now, as you make this trip, as you walk this path, and you finish out that path, you complete it through serving other people, guess what? You even in more ways discover God's power and presence in your life. You in even more ways connect to other Christians. You in even more ways grow in your relationship and become spiritually mature in your life. But this last piece is so vitally important and it's so often missed. In our Christian culture that is consumeristic in mindset, that seems about... Well, I'm going to come to church and you feed me, you serve me, you give to me, and I will receive. In that culture, what we're saying is that we have a totally different mission. And it is unique. And we are saying, and we are experiencing, that there is great, great joy in serving others and that we benefit when we give to other people. That we are the recipients when we give to other people. And so we are just holding up that value here at the Brook Church to say we're going to serve others freely and fully. We're going to serve the community and through our missions we're going to serve the whole world in some way. We're going to be the kinds of Christians who are leveraging our time and our talents and our treasures toward giving to other people. And as we do that, we will be the ones who benefit and the ones who are blessed. For as Jesus said, there's more joy in giving than in receiving. Now we preach that a lot, but we don't ever really practice it. And I'm telling you, we're just hardwiring that into the DNA of who we are as a church. And it's difficult sometimes, isn't it? You know, it's usually inconvenient to do the right thing. I don't know why that is. I wish it wasn't so. It's just kind of like with food. All the good food tastes bad. (laughs) Right? With serving, you know, usually it's, it's inconvenient. Why is that? Because God is using this as a way of growing our character. You see, there are some people, many people in our world who are too lazy or too immature or too insecure or too self absorbed and too selfish to give themselves to other people. And if you're a believer and those characteristics are true about your life, you are not honoring God with your life. You're just not. And so in this world where we see Christians that take and take and take and take, we're saying what elevates Christ, what honors Him is a community of people who give in service to one another in the church and who give in service to others outside the church. God will bless and honor a church like that. He is blessing and honoring a church like that. Serving. The final piece of the puzzle. Real simple. Discover, connect, grow, serve. Now, let me share with you in the time that remaining some application of this and what this is going to mean for us in 2011. What will happen to a church like that? What will happen to a church like that? Well, what did Jesus have to say? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. 
verses 13 through 18. Let's read about this experience between Peter and Jesus, because Jesus has something to say about the church that will put into practice the things that we've just described, the church that will actually be the church, as described in Acts. Let's read it together, beginning in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, now this region is to the northeast of Galilee, and it's in the furthest reaches of the country. So Jesus is kind of remotely away from where might be the Jewish population of people. He's in the far reaches of the northeast, and he asked his disciples this question, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, that phrase, the Son of Man, was used on several instances by Jesus before this point in the record of the Gospel of Matthew. And so they knew exactly who he was talking about. Son of Man is a term that referred to Messiah. Son of Man was a term that was referred to Jesus being God. And we read in Daniel this prophecy about the Son of Man. So these guys who were Jews knew exactly what he meant when he said Son of Man. He was saying, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? Verse 14, they replied, well, some say John the Baptist. There was a belief, and even Herod himself was fearful that John the Baptist would resurrect and would come back. And so two chapters before this, we read about John the Baptist beheading, how he was martyred because of his faith at the whim of the queen. John the Baptist had died. And so here was this suspicion that Jesus was John the Baptist resurrected. Others say Elijah. This is in accordance with the prophecy in Malachi that there would be an Elijah who would come. And he would come with uniqueness and power. And, of course, Jesus fulfills that prophecy. He is an Elijah of sorts, a prophet in and of himself. And still others, Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Verse 15, here is the key question. Now, before this, I want you to notice a couple things in Jesus' question and their response. Notice, first of all, that there were differing opinions. Some say one thing about who Jesus was. Others say another thing about who Jesus was. Now, you go to people on the street today and you say to them, who do you think Jesus is? You're going to get differing opinions. A lot of people have a lot of differing and even honorable opinions about who Jesus is. But notice also that despite the fact that these were honorable opinions that were really the result of respect and admiration, some people would say in today's world that Jesus was a great man, that he was a very good teacher, that he was a spiritual guru, maybe even would say that he was a political revolutionary. Honorable opinions, opinions of respect, But notice this, though they were honorable, they were inaccurate. They were wrong. According to Jesus, all those were wrong opinions. Is it possible to have good opinions in Christ, of Christ, and yet inaccurate ones? Yeah, it is. Verse 15. The conversation changes. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Now, this is such a powerful and penetrating question. It is a question for the ages, really. It is a question that each and every person must ask and answer. Those who have heard about Jesus Christ must ask and answer this question. Who do you say that I am? Folks, because it's not really important who theologians say Jesus is. It's not really ultimately important for you what a church or a pastor or in a sermon might say about who Jesus is or what others or your friends might say or your family members might say about who Jesus is. Who do you say that he is? It's a personal and powerful question that you must answer. Well, Peter speaks up as was his 
pattern. Verses 16 through 18, Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Jesus could not have been more pleased. Blessed are you, Simon Peter. Good job. You have answered correctly. You have chosen wisely. You have gotten it right. Yes, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. And now Jesus talks for a moment here about the church. The church. He says, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now there's a play on words, and some of you have heard this before. Play on words between some uh, phrases that are in this passage. Peter's name literally means rock. It means small rock. But nonetheless, it means stone or pebble or rock. And so he has a proper name, Peter, but the meaning behind it is rock. And then Jesus says, you are Peter. You are Petros is the original word. But upon this Petra, Petra being a female term of the word, meaning big rock. Foundation rock, solid rock. So, Peter, you are small rock, but upon this big rock, I will build my church. Now, what did he mean by that when he was saying, upon this rock? What, did, what was the rock? Well, some have interpreted this passage to mean that he was talking about Peter. Peter, upon you, I will build my church. And, of course, this is where our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters believe. And from that point here in Matthew chapter 16, they believe that there is this line of succession from Peter to the popes that we have in today's world. And that this person, Peter, was to be the foundation of the church. And that the church in today's world is to be a succession of people from Peter. Now, we don't believe that. We don't believe the church is to be built upon a person, a fallible human being, Maybe Jesus meant people like Peter. That's closer. But this is what I believe Jesus meant. He meant upon the rock of this great statement of faith that you have just made, Peter. This great confession of faith that Peter just made, that statement will be the foundation of the church, of Jesus' church. And look at the personal pronoun, my church. It's the only time Jesus ever uses the phrase, my church, in the Gospels. Upon this rock, I will build my church upon the statement of faith that you just made, Peter, that I am the Christ, I am the Son of the living God. Despite conventional wisdom, despite what is said about me, Peter, upon that rock, the church that says... Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the church of Jesus Christ. That is the church that he says will prevail against the gates of hell. A church that is made up of individuals that proclaim and practice that Jesus is the Christ is a church that will be absolutely unstoppable. It's the church that he will bless and he will use. So, what does it mean? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's give some content to that and then we're going to finish up. That Jesus was God. Now, even in today's world, again, you'll get differing opinions about who Jesus is. He's a great teacher, a really good guy, did a lot of amazing things but then fall short of describing him as the son of the living God. And so the person that says that is the one that says, listen, he is Lord, he is Savior, he is God. That he is the hope of salvation for mankind. That Jesus is the hope of eternal life. That Jesus in today's world in 2011 is the hope of love and peace and power for living. The church that believes that nothing can transform the human heart like Jesus Christ is a church 
that will prevail against the forces of evil. There's not a professor in a classroom. There's not a businessman. There's not a scientist. There's not a politician in Washington that can transform the human heart like a relationship with Jesus Christ. He is the hope of life transformation. And the rock of Christ's church, the one that will endure, the one that will prevail, is a church that not only proclaims but practices that belief. He is the center. He is it. So, a couple of applications. This passage, first of all, assumes that there is an enemy to Christ's church. Now, that may be news to you. Jesus, in saying that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, is making an assumption that the church has an enemy. And that enemy is the very forces of evil. That there is an enemy to the church who says that Christ is it. That he is the son of the living God. That he is the Messiah. And that enemy will stop at nothing to get the church to quit. That enemy will seek to divide and to divert, to disappoint. That enemy will seek to do its very best to stop a church that says that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, to stop it from achieving its potential. That's the enemy. But the second thing that this passage does, it teaches that the church that proclaims and practices this confession of faith in Christ is a church that will prevail against the forces of evil. It's a promise. It's a promise made in advance. Now, today we're going to watch some football games this afternoon. Can you imagine if there was an NFL coach that announced to his team and to the public (laughs) that said, I guarantee victory. I guarantee that if we will employ this game plan, if we will remember our purpose, I guarantee that there will be no opponent that will be able to stop us. And that it happened? That'd be quite a statement. In fact, there are a lot of coaches and players that are, you know, kind of pensive about making guarantees of victory. Christ gives us a guarantee of victory. We will win. The score is already up on the scoreboard. The game is tough. The game sometimes has injuries. The game sometimes has distractions. The game sometimes takes discipline. But the victory is already there. It is guaranteed. Through Christ Jesus, all we have to do is play the game. All we have to do is implement the purpose and the strategy. And that is the proclamation and the practice that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, again, in our day and age, when there's a lot of glitz and glitter in church, that message tends to be lost. And we just want to keep that front and center at the brook. And the promise is, if we will, if we do, we will prevail. Who is on the offense in this passage? Jesus says, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Who's on the offense? The church. The church is not cowering. The church is not wimpy. The church is not anemic. The church is not weak. The church is driving the ball down the field. It's not passive. It's not reactive. It's active and advancing forward, achieving what God wants. That's the church that's on offense. Who's on defense? The gates of hell. The gates of hell. The gates of hell that surround the very forces of evil will not stand against the church that proclaims and practices Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
But what does that mean for you and me in 2011? It means that we need to change our mindset. And those of us who've been around here for a long time, we need to remember our mindset. It's not about coming to church. It's about being the church. Big difference. It's not about coming to hear a presentation. It's about coming and participating in the process of the reality of all that God envisioned for the church to be and to do. And I'm telling you, we just measure things differently here at the Brook Church. It's not our goal to be the biggest church in the community. It's, it's just not. So you say, well, I can see that you're accomplishing that goal pretty well, <laughs> right? <laughs> we, we are focusing faithfully on the promises of God. We're focusing to be faithful to the purpose that He has given us. And we are letting the chips fall where they may. And if that results in a great big church, great. If it doesn't, then that's okay too. Because one day we're going to get there and he's going to say to you and to me, well done, good and faithful servant. You did on this earth what you were supposed to do. And you did it with all your heart, with all your courage. And if I can just get to heaven and I can hear Christ say to me, Mike, you sure messed up a lot. (laughs) You weren't the most gifted and talented person. But Mike, I love your heart. And I love your courage. And you died trying. I'm kind of wore out today, to be honest with you. It was a long week. I was afraid I was going to get emotional because I wanted to get tired physically. I'd kind of get emotional. But it's a good tired. And I just want to run that race, cross that finish line into heaven, And I want to be worn out and weary for this short time that God has given me on this earth. If I'm lucky, maybe 70 years. And at the end of that, I want to have spent myself in the way that Christ wanted me to. And I bet you do too. I bet that that strikes a chord in your heart. And you say, there's something more to this life than me, myself, and I. There's something more. And you've tried that, and it's just not working. It's only caused you to be more joyless and more self-absorbed. You want to leverage yourself towards something that matters, that's bigger than you. And the time is so short. It is passing us by. And that's not to put pressure on us. That's not to walk in the flesh. It's just to say, today is the day. For you and me to experience what God has. for The life that you're living is the life that you're living. Now is the time for you to roll up your sleeves and to jump in. And to say, I'm going to be the church. Not just come to church. Now, that message doesn't get a lot of book offers. <laughs> it doesn't tend to pack a room. But it is the gospel truth. God created the church to be something that is powerful and life-giving. And we're just going to pursue it at the brook. Come hell or high water, we're just going to pursue it. We have, and we are, and we will. 2011 is going to be a great, great year for us. 2010 was a great year. All of the years have been great. When we have the right perspective, they really have. We're going to have a great year. Buckle up. Get in the seat. And enjoy the ride. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Let's pray.